It is my pleasure to introduce our bicentennial medalist, Wole Coxum, class of 1992. In the effort to change systems that oppress communities of colors, you stand at the forefront. In your case, those systems are the financial ones, long understood but seldom acted upon, that help to drive crushing disparities of wealth. Unavailable to a third of Americans are the traditional banking services that most of us take for granted. For them, it is payday loans, check cashers, and pawn shops, operations designed to extract wealth rather than to build it. With the brain of a J.P. Morgan managing director and a heart broken by the death of Michael Brown, you took the bold step of launching Mobility Capital Finance as a vehicle to reimagine banking for these communities. MocaFi harnesses technology to ensure that access to free or low-cost FDIC-backed services need never again depend on your race, ethnicity, or zip code. Home health care providers, bus drivers, and municipal workers can now just photograph a check and draw from their account with a debit card. They can pay rent in ways that boost their credit score, get financial advice, and finance their business launch. And, as if that were not cool enough, you have partners with members of the Wu-Tang Clan to launch Triumph, a free startup school for Black and Latinx entrepreneurs. In all of this, you are fulfilling the thwarted dream of your grandfather, which was to launch a bank that would truly advance his community. That is quite a legacy. In recognition of your distinguished achievement in promoting economic justice, Williams College is proud to honor you with its bicentennial medal. In a conventional year, I would bestow the medal on Wole, shake his hand, pause so we can have our picture taken, and then invite him to speak. This is no conventional year, so we're going to do it a little differently. Greetings, my fellow classmates, families, and friends of Williams College. I have the distinguished pleasure of welcoming you to the 131st gathering of Class Day. Today we're here to celebrate our endurance and survival skills. It's impossible to learn and grow at Williams without experiencing the wonders of success and the hardships of falling short of your particular goals. Yet somehow we all made it, and as we look back, it's clear that we have a great deal to be thankful for. We deserve a huge hand. It is an honor to accept the Bicentennial Medal from Williams College. I am sorry that we're not here all together to be able to celebrate today, but I'm hopeful that you'll get the spirit of my appreciation through these remarks. Thinking back to my senior year at Williams, I was on top of the world. I had just come back from the Williams and Oxford program. Right after that, I spent a summer in Helsinki, Finland, working on government policy there. And then I came to live in the Blue House, is what it was called at that time, off campus in Williamstown with several of my good friends who were some of the leaders on campus. One person was the captain of the lacrosse team. The other person was captain of the basketball team. The other person was president of the Black Student Union. The other person was the best DJ on campus. And we also had the president of the class. That was me. And you had seven black men living together uh, in Williamstown in the early 90s. It was a very special time. Our conversations were hopeful as we imagined endless possibilities of things that we could and might accomplish in our lives. Sometimes I think we suffered from having a little too much confidence. When it came time to look for a job, I thought every firm in Wall Street would want to hire me. A Williams student, varsity rower, three summers working on Wall Street, a summer job in Finland, and pretty good grades. What wasn't to like about me and my profile? I had Wall Street investment banker written all over my future. I'll never forget when a prestigious firm, Merrill Lynch, 
invited me to a super Saturday in New York City to visit for a weekend in New York City and have interviews for uh, two days for a two-year financial analyst program. They rolled out the red carpet. They put me up in a midtown Manhattan hotel with an expense account for a weekend of activities. The first round of interviews happened on the Saturday and I thought I had just nailed it. Cracking jokes, telling great stories, explaining my past. I was a shoe in or so I thought. After 3 p.m. of interviews and it all ended, my um, instructions were to go back to the hotel and wait by the phone. This is sort of pre cell phone. And at six o'clock or soon thereafter, I'd get a call with instructions about the next day's worth of interviews. Now, if a call didn't come, then I would be free to have a weekend in New York City on Merrill Lynch. Well, I'm still waiting for that call. Unbeknownst to me at the time, this was an important turning point in my life. Why? Because it allowed me to find comfort in embracing non-traditional opportunities. Yes, my ego was a little shattered that I didn't get the role. This, that was a healthy lesson for me and one that I learned many times over the course of my life. But it opened doors that I would have otherwise missed and put me onto a different path. This stage of my life reminds me of a stanza from the Robert Frost poem, The Road Not Taken. Two roads diverged in a wood and I, I took the one less traveled by and that has made all the difference. When I arrived back to Williamstown after my weekend in New York City, I got a call from the head of career counseling, Fatma Kasamali. She gave me some feedback about my interview in New York City. She said they loved the resume, liked my sense of humor, my academic record was acceptable, but they didn't think I was serious about being an investment banker. Apparently my khakis and blue blazer gave them pause about my commitment to investment banking and continuing the interview process. I think it's possible that deep down inside, I didn't want to be an investment banker and I was signaling to them by what I was wearing. Nonetheless, I learned the valuable lesson that looking the part for any role that you want to get is very, very important. She did say, Fatma that is, that there was a small company based in Baltimore called Commercial Credit that I should take a look at. It. A Williams alum, Bob Lip, class of 60, was a part of the management team and was interested in hiring a couple of kids from Williams. It just so happened that Bob's son, Jeff, was in my year and I think that influenced Bob's decision to really engage with Williams kids that particular year. So I did some homework and I found out that William, that, that commercial credit was a company that had a real sense of purpose, that they were trying to change financial services. So I applied and I was fortunate enough to get the job. So happened that myself and Bob Lip's son's best friend, Jim Ryan, also got the job. Jim and I became roommates in Baltimore and he ha happened to be my roommate freshman year. And so it all came full circle. Commercial credit was very special and I don't name drop, but I'm going just indulge me in this one instance. The people that were at commercial credit were names like Sandy Weil, Jamie Dimon, Heidi Miller, Charlie Scharf, Joe Plumeri and Chuck Prince. And they were on a mission to reimagine financial services. And they were fortunate enough, or I was fortunate enough, I should say, to be invited to join that journey and transform financial services they did. 10 years after, within 10 years of my joining, that company transformed itself from a tiny company in Baltimore 
to becoming Citigroup, the largest financial services company in the world. Being a part of the commercial credit to Citigroup evolution was a special experience for me. I didn't care much about my title. I didn't really care much about the projects that I worked on. Instead, I wanted to be a part of how to transform financial services to impact people's lives. I was learning different aspects of financial services. I was solving problems every day and I was helping the team win. Every day, we saw ourselves as the underdog trying to take on the world. Before I knew it, 10 years had gone by and I had a series of experiences and relationships that would propel me into some of the most senior roles in financial services. Let's fast forward a little bit to 2014. At this point, I'd become a managing director at JP Morgan Chase, working on providing banking services to small businesses all across this country. I was head of sales of business banking. I was responsible for thousands of people and millions of customers. On the surface, everything seemed to be great. But something was missing for me. I was no longer learning. I didn't feel valued. And the communities that I cared about were increasingly moving to the margins of our society from a financial services perspective. Remember, this was the time right after the Great Recession that forced banks to retool how they did business. And what that meant was closing branches. 80% of the bank branches that have closed in this community in this country have been in low and moderate income communities. It meant uh, closing accounts for good customers just because those customers might have been too difficult to do the appropriate background check. So instead of making going through the hassle and making it possible, they just sort of close the accounts for the good people. And at the same time, they changed the product set that disproportionately and negatively impacted black and brown communities. About that same time, I heard a story on National Public Radio that asked the question, what is worse? being unemployed or underemployed? While being employed, while being unemployed is not good, it is an opportunity to find the right role or job that leverages all of your talents. It's filled with great possibility. While being underemployed means you've got a job and you're making money, but what you're capable of contributing is more than what you do every day. And that question really gnawed at me. I concluded that being underemployed was worse than being underemployed, than being unemployed, excuse me. And after a great deal of reflection, I realized that I would remain underemployed so long as I stayed in a large bank setting. I had to make a choice about whether I wanted to spend the remaining time of my working life underemployed. Then the death of Michael Brown happened. That was my George Floyd moment. I could not bear to watch the impact that that murder had on his family, his community, and this country without somehow being a part of the conversation. My thought was a social justice agenda without an economic justice agenda is like one hand clapping. While there are many social justice plans in motion through the NAACP, the National Urban League, the National Action, Action Network and other organizations, the country did not seem to have a robust strategy for how to provide economic mobility to financially underserved and underrepresented communities. I thought I could add some interesting solutions to that national conversation. So I quit my job and started Mocafi. And Mocafi is a mobile first platform that's focused on financial inclusion by creating value and adding financial stability to the 50 million people 
who are unbanked or underbanked in this country. Remember that Robert Frost line, two, two roads diverged in a wood and I, I took the road less traveled by. And that has made all the difference. In my case, that is most certainly true. Gone are my concerns about being unemployed or underemployed. In fact, I'm overemployed and I love it. What I enjoy most about my work now is that every day I'm using my training, relationships, and experience that were perfected at Williams to address a market failure in the United States. There's no reason why someone should not have a safe place to keep their money. Bank accounts should be available to everyone, regardless of immigration status, regardless of geography, and regardless of income bracket. And there's lots of analysis to suggest that financial health is closely tied to mental health, physical health, and community engagement. And unfortunately, we are living through a time that shows the disparate impact that lack of financial access can have on certain groups in our society. When I received the note from President Mandel informing me that I had been selected as a recipient for the Bicentennial Medal, I immediately shared the news with my family. My eldest daughter, Quinn, asked, are you sure that they have the right Coxum? She was referring to my father, Edward C. Coxum Jr., class of 66, who has had a distinguished career as a lawyer, an activist, and a political strategist. Once I got confirmation that the Williams College Executive Committee selected me for this honor, I realized that my being here today is the result of generations of distinguished people and achievers in my community, including my dad, providing me with the blueprint and mentorship for my journey. The honor to speak with you today would not be possible without them living purposeful lives and being role models for my peers and me. And as a result, I like to say that I'm carrying the baton in this particular leg of the relay race to leave our society better than when I found it. Running fast and hard, building upon the work and contributions of those who dedicated their lives to the improvement of others. So I have an ask of you. Please keep running hard in your leg of life's relay race. There are a lot of big problems and challenges in the world today that need bold thinkers and more importantly, need doers. We need people who have grand visions, who are willing to jump into the fight and get stuff done. At 50, I feel like I'm halfway through my leg of the relay race. And let me tell you, it hasn't been without its challenges and disappointments, but that is part of the fun. And I would not be here today sharing my story with you without my various experiences, both good and bad. Williams being one of the very good ones and very important ones in my journey. So just imagine 30 years from now, Someone might say to you, I'm glad you took a chance, tried to change the world, and leave the place better than you found it. That is very possible. It happened to me, so it can certainly happen for you. Two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. I am excited. I'm as excited today about the future as I was in class day of 1992. 
Please don't lose your enthusiasm. Let passion be your fuel in life. We're counting on you. Thank you very much.